All right, let's bring in Ambassador Bolos Lolo, who is a former permanent secretary at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Thank you so much uh, for joining us on Newsnight. Welcome to Newsnight. Let's uh, begin with that call being made by a civil society organization that the term limits should be set within all ECOWAS countries as a way of putting an end, a permanent end, uh, to coups in the region. How far do you think uh, this could go? Well, thank you again, Ungozi, and good to be back on your program. Um, the question about term limits is an issue of governance, and it behoves those in power to respect the Constitution. Where there is failure to respect the Constitution, recourse to anything but the rule of law will always create the condition for instability. And what we have seen in Niger is a clear case of discontent. But the real reason behind that discontent is hard to say. Because within 24 hours, first the coup in Niger started with the presidential guards. It was 24 hours later before the army issued a statement to say that they were in support of the move by the presidential guards. But beyond that is the question here of how well our leaders govern when they get political mandate. And if we are to respect term limits, it means there should be no manipulation of the constitution. The elections that bring in leaders must be transparent. The elections must be free and fair and they must be a reflection of the will of the people. Now, in ECOWAS, there is the protocol on, on democracy and good governance. And if you read that protocol, there are two main concerns that are expressed in the opening. The first is with international terrorism. And the second concern expressed by African leaders, uh, West African leaders, when they signed that protocol, in 2001 was the issue of religious intolerance. They talked about political marginalization. And then the third issue that they talked about was non-transparent elections. Now, if you combine all three, intolerance in religion, you talk about manipulation and marginalization of electoral processes. And then when it comes to elections, that the will of the people does not hold. This put together will always create the issue of legitimacy for any government. And if we are to deepen and sustain the culture of democracy in West Africa and Africa as a whole, it means that when it is time to conduct an election, all the field must be level for all candidates. It must be free of manipulation of any sort. And indeed, the electoral outcome should be in line with the will of the people. This, in a nutshell, is what I see as lacking in some countries. We've seen in Burkina Faso. We have seen in Mali. There was an attempt in Guinea-Bissau. We've seen the issue also in Guinea itself. And not too long ago, in Sao Tome and Principe even though Sao Tome is not within the West Africa sub-region, but it's not far away from us. Mm -hmm. So we have to respect the electoral processes. Okay, now the, the countries you've mentioned, Mali, uh, Burkina Faso, now Niger, uh, these are Francophone countries. Could it be, uh, if you look at that trend, could it be that these countries are getting tired of uh, the French overloads in their countries, and they just want a way out of uh, the French-influenced leaderships? Not, I mean, it's one thing to put too much premium on what the French are doing in their former colonies, but more importantly, let us address what happens internally in our countries, because it's not just a Francophone phenomenon, if you look at it, uh, but yes, the prevalence has been in former French colonies. I talked earlier on about our internal dynamics and processes and procedures. It's not anybody who would come to tell you 
where there is manipulation. It's not anybody who will come and tell you where there is marginalization. And I always advocate, and I'm advocating here as well, the need for good governance for its own sake. Where there is good governance, it means the government that is in power has the support of the people. That government is responding to the basic needs of the people. And when you go like in our constitution, I believe it is the fundamental principles of Nigeria's uh, constitution in chapter 2 that talks about the responsibility of government. And there are two main responsibilities here, security and the well-being of the people. Every other thing would be subsumed in these two. And if you ask about our national interest as a country, I'll put it solely in the context of the safety and security of Nigerians and their well-being. That is foremost. And once you have it, then it means government will be there to see to it that basic services are provided, infrastructure is provided, job opportunity is created, and there is a level playing field. It speaks volumes, and only recently I was talking to some 10-year-olds who were speaking about their experiences in their classrooms. Imagine a 10-year-old being conscious, being aware, and even talking and condemning their own mate who goes to the class to boast about their parents because the parents are displaying a culture in the home that these children are bringing back to the classroom. Now, if we have so descended to the level that a 10-year-old will call his own mate boastful because the classmate goes to say, oh, they don't need to concentrate in school, they are unruly because their parents are rich, what are we creating? We are now creating a class where tomorrow, and that tomorrow is not far away from today, you are going to have a generation of Nigerians that are aware and are excluded. So let our internal processes be inclusive. Let our internal processes be fair, equity, I mean equitable and just. Then you bring this into governance as a whole, that if your mandate is for four years, allow the people to decide that after four years it should be extended for you and not for you to use the same privilege to insist that you must remain in power. Um, very quickly, before we bring on uh, the next uh, story, how do you think the school in Niger will impact on uh, efforts to push back uh, jihadists within uh, the, you know, the sub-region of ECOWAS? How do you think it will affect the jihadist uh, war? And uh, first of all, uh, Ambassador, please do stay with us. We want to get your thoughts on this next story, and then you can respond. All right. Story on, is carry. ready, is it? Well, well, Russia's President Vladimir Putin, let me just bring it to you, a promise to supply uh, free grain to six African countries. Putin is hosting African leaders, of course, uh, for the second Russia-Africa summit in St. Petersburg. The expiry of the Black Sea grain deal has raised concerns over rising food prices and shortages in Africa. However, the two-day forum is being seen as an affirmation of Putin's uh, support uh, for the continent. Uh, Mr. Ambassador, you want to respond to that. Uh, Russia's offer to give uh, free grain uh, to six African countries. I uh, wonder if Nigeria's name is on that list. How would you respond to that? And of course, the question I asked you earlier. I pray that Nigeria is not on the list of the six countries for a start. And my reason is simple. Africa has no reason to go a begging abroad for food. And in this case, again, when it comes to the issue of our governance, we must create that space for people could, to go to their farms and work. A single farmer failing to work because of insecurity is a deficit on our food security in itself. That's one. Number two, you asked about the network here to fight terror. The 48 hours that have elapsed in, 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 in Niger without President uh, Mohammed Bazoum, a fine gentleman that I know and I met, I worked with him closely uh, in times past, 
is a partner to Nigeria. I'm not saying that the military will not also be partners, but the military have no place in governance according to our constitutions. And therefore, the military is ill-prepared, ill-equipped, and not capable of providing the type of leadership that civilians should provide. So I don't see, nor am I hopeful, that we are going to have a partnership with whoever emerges outside of the constitutional arrangement in Niger. And on the issue again of Russia, it pains me to see that there are two factions in Niger that have come out. The supporters of the president who are for restoration of constitutional order were the first to come out. Now, when we saw a, a group, a crowd that I would say has been paid to counter in support of the coup, some of them were waving Russian flags. What has the Russian flag got to do with Niger? Isn't it a case and an indication here that there is foreign interest involved? The Wagner group in Russia that is involved in Ukraine are soldiers for hire, guns for hire. They are assassins, they are mercenaries that we must not tolerate in our sub-region. And therefore, if Russia is offering grains to six African countries, I suppose there are 54, if not 55 African countries that are there. What happens then to the 49 or 48 if there are only 54 countries? Don't they need support? And why is it even that 54 African countries will line up to shake hands with a single Russian president who is their equal? So I am strongly opposed to single country partnership with Africa as a continent. But at the end of the day, if our leaders will govern us and govern us well, if they will fulfill the mandate for which they campaign always to be given the mandate and deliver on the goods as we desire, then our country will be better for it. We want to see a Nigeria. We want to see a West Africa. We want to see an Africa where your religion will not matter, your ethnicity will not matter, your social background will not matter, but what will matter is your humanity. And where that humanity comes out, it means then we will be blind to the parochial and narrow interests that have divided us. This is what I'm advocating for our country. And I hope we'll live to see that day when we're not judged by the mundane issue of religion, mm -hmm. ethnicity, social background, but your value as mm. a human being. Your value as a human being. And Ambassador. one last thing here I would yeah. say. Yes. It was President John Kennedy who said, where you make peaceful change, impossible. impossible. You violent. make violent change inevitable. inevitable. Yeah. <laughs> so let us create that situation where there is harmony and cohesion in our country. Right, Ambassador. and there's no better way to <laughs> you, live it. Your tonight. insights tonight have been so Excellent. inspiring. Thank you, Ambassador Bolus Lolo, uh, for joining us on Newsnight. Thank you. That's the former Permanent Secretary, Minister of uh, Foreign Affairs.